Hello, and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest to reintroduce to you today. Dr. Adrian Sotomoda is a former guest on our show. Be sure to check out episode 138 of Boundless Body Radio, which was part of a special series we did featuring Dr. Nick Norwitz as the guest host. Dr. Adrian Sotomoda is an MD, a PhD, and specialist in internal medicine and data science. He is a researcher at the Metabolic Disease Research Unit at the National Institute for Medical Sciences and Nutrition in Mexico. Dr. Sotomoto is primarily interested in human metabolism. He is passionate about studying low carbohydrate and ketogenic diets and how they impact our metabolism. Dr. Sotomoto earned his MD from the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de Mexico, his PhD at Oxford, and also his PhD at Oxford. He has created many resources to help people successfully implement a low carbohydrate diet and provides that help for both English and Spanish speaking individuals. He is the co-author of a 2022 study titled The Lipid Energy Model, Reimagining Lipoprotein Function in the Context of Carbohydrate-Restricted Diets, which was also co-authored by Dr. Dick, Nick Norwitz, who we already mentioned, and another former guest of ours, Dr. Sorry, not Dr. Dave Feldman, among others. Dr. Adrian Sotomoto, what an absolute honor it is to welcome you to Boundless Body Radio. Thank you so much for having me again. Thank you so much for the invitation and for the opportunity of share our work, our questions our hypothesis, and to be with you and your listeners again. Well, so fantastic to host you again. I absolutely butchered the introduction. I apologize for that. No, not throw, at all. If you're watching, <laughs> you can see the YouTube. You can see all the things that I crossed out that were originally in Spanish that I tried to write in in English, and it made it like it's so not difficult. At all, not at all. <laughs> no, 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 not at funny. all. It was, it was very good. Super funny. Well, we're we're absolutely honored to host you back on the show, despite my terrible, uh, you know, Spanish pretending to stumble around in Spanish. Not before we, we <laughs> before we deep dive into your story, you led our conversation last time with something that I found equal parts funny and equal parts really sad, and I really thought of it as kind of a representation of where we are in the world as far as fighting obesity. Can you tell us about the churro? <laughs> the the the, I mean. Churros are something that uh, most Mexicans, and I, I think it's it's actually, I mean, to be fair, to be fair, and to avoid any unnecessary tribalism, uh, churros are also found in, in Spain. The recipes are slightly different. Of course, being Mexican and being uh, extremely proud of our uh, we started really like skills in the kitchen. We, we think our recipe is better than the Spanish one. But churros are basically uh, fried flour, of course, fried in vegetable oil, and of course, uh, wheat flour, which after being deep fried, are coated into plain sugar and are sipped into chocolate milk, hot chocolate milk. There are different recipes, recipes for chocolate milk. Uh, ours has two extra portions of sugar. So it's basically fried flour coated in sugar and sipped in, in sugar in a sugary drink. And this is the context. When I was a resident, when I was an internal medicine resident, uh, we had a professor from Washington U uh, as a guest for the opening of our new metabolic research center, which is what, where I work now. So this unit was, was, was uh, yeah, opened five years ago. And this professor from Washington, you came to deliver a keynote lecture and to more or less uh, talk about his work, but also where he thinks or where he thought the field should move in the next years. And of course, the best way Mexicans have to show appreciation and love and our understanding of being a good guest and the international stereotype of mi casa tu casa is when someone you are glad to host comes to your place, you try to provide for them to the best possible food. And this professor arrived on a Thursday uh, noon and they took him out for lunch or for dinner and after that they took him for dessert and they wanted to have churros and after having this dessert he he delivered his his lecture on friday morning and he started it by saying 
forget about it, guys. You're basically doomed because there is no way you can fight against this perfect mixture of refined carbs with uh, deeply fried in uh, fried oil that at the same time is so cheap to produce. Part of what makes us the second most obese country in the world and part of what makes us having the fattest skits in the world is that we are particularly good mixing refined carbohydrates with uh, rapidly oxidizable fats and for almost no money. Because actually part of the, of the social welfare strategies of the government is to subsidize some foods and some ingredients. The problem some of us think is that the ones we're subsidizing are the wrong ones. We should be subsidizing eggs. We, we should be subsidizing meat, uh, not flour and vegetable oil. But anyway, uh, wow. part of the context of the place I, uh, uh, well, and that's also something I, I need to disclose and something I share with my patients from time to time. I, as most Mexican kids, I was a fat one. I, I was an obese kid until I turned 14, 15 years old and puberty and tennis made me lose the extra weight I had. And when I was halfway there, I thought, well, I already lost this weight, I'm gonna keep going. But my brain developed for 15 years in an obese environment. And of course, if I walk by a churros place, I start salivating as uh, any Pavlovian dog and my, my brain manages to bring back all the amazing memories and good feelings I have attached to, me, to, to, to feelings and to memories. And to, so when, when, when that, that's something I actually use as part of the advice for, for the patients I counsel now when they have little kids. I share with them, my life would be easier if my brain hadn't developed in such an obesogenic environment. I mean, wow. it was... Uh, fortunately, now I am okay, but if that's, if that's the emotions you attach to your, to your upbringing, uh, it's, it's hard or harder to, to make healthy food choices. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's such a great point. And I think all of us, you know, if we've grown up around the same time, have similar stories. I mean, I think of foods like donuts around here that are deep fried, flour based, covered in sugar. And, you know, you can buy them at soda shops or you can also buy, you know, a giant bucket of soda for a few bucks and it's got extra syrup pumped into it. And it's crazy. I lived in Brazil for two years and down there, this was 20 years ago, but down there they had, um, they called them pastéis. And so uh, pastel, yeah. and they would fill the same thing. They would fill something with you know oftentimes it would be you know jam or chocolate and then they would dip it in chocolate and it was absolutely delicious and back then like there wasn't an obesity crisis in brazil i would say most people were pretty thin i'm not sure what the state of it is now but, but back then i remember that was perfectly acceptable for breakfast like having cake for breakfast was not like out of the norm i was like oh this is great i love this culture sure for sure i mean something a typical breakfast for i don't know uh most people living in mexico city is something called torta de tamal or guajolota. And I'm going to describe this as subjective as possible. Tamal is a Mexican word for gigantic ravioli. So you basically have uh, flour, pocket size pastry, filled some, sometimes with just sauce, but it's made with corn flour and fried. And after that, you put that in a sandwich. And they typically have that with a corn flour drink named Atole. Wow. So you're basically having flour inside flour, sipped it with a flour drink. No wonder why diabetes doesn't stop rising, you know? That's it's, that's crazy. <laughs> it's like inception. It's like a dream within a dream within yeah, a dream. Exactly. It's crazy. It's wow. multiple layers of refined carbohydrates. Wow. Well, before we go any further bashing Mexican cuisine, we have to establish <laughs> what we established in our last conversation. Scientifically based, objectively speaking, 
Mexican cuisine is the best in the world. This has been settled by scientists. Not it's just a fact. I mean, just it's, 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 it's just a fact. It's it's simply a cold hard fact. That's right. That's it. Yeah, it's that's it's it. basically. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Absolutely. Oh, that's amazing. Well, I would love to hear your story kind of growing up. You grew up in quite the intellectual household and you yeah. you decided to choose um, medicine, but to, uh, definitely like a different kind of medicine. It's very interesting. So tell us a little bit about your experience and how you got into ACL health. Is starting in sure. Um, my, my parents, well, my, my, my mother, uh, she's a philosopher and then she earned a second, uh, back degree on 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 yeah education and and yeah the, the philosophy of education you could say my father he's a mathematician and then he did economics and my brother he did he he, he wanted to be the favorite so he did economics and philosophy to be nice. <laughs> each parents know so so uh, and I, I sometimes say that I was perhaps one of the few who disappointed their parents by entering into med school. Because when I said, when I said, okay, I got into med school, my father was like, oh, are you sure? Really? He was a little <laughs> bit worried because he couldn't be as helpful as if I had uh, gone into mathematics, which was actually my second, my second choice in uh, UNAM, which is the university I studied in. It's a public university. Uh, it's absolutely free, which, which is fantastic. And it's, well, it's, it's hard to get in, so to speak. I mean, there, it, there's lots of competition with the admission exams. So my plan was if I didn't make it into, if I didn't make it into, into med school there, which is like the prestigious university for, for medicine, my plan was to go for math. And I ended up doing a bit of both. Uh, I, always, uh, I always enjoyed uh, doing math. And when I learned statistics in high school, and also with the help of my father, uh, I also kind of fell in love with the idea of analyzing data. And this was way before these terms of data science and machine learning. I mean, people say that data science or machine learning are just fancy new words for statistics. And in a way, it's true. Uh, but I always knew that I was going to uh, pursue a research career and a clinical career. I do believe that uh, clinicians who do research are amazing clinicians, are better clinicians. And researchers who also have clinical background or context uh, also bring, I mean, they are able to bring those insights into their, their respective fields. So in the end, because I was not afraid to numbers and because I enjoyed this type of analysis, I ended up doing a bit of both. So. My first line of research is human metabolism, but most or other collaborations I typically have involve data analysis. And that's why uh, I, I, I have some weird papers. I, I have dermatology papers or gynecology papers or, or something that sometimes is not extremely outside, but fairly outside of my main field. And I do believe that my uh, exposure to other clinical fields through these statistical collaborations informs better my uh, well, benefits, the way I do research on my main uh, focus, which is human metabolism. So wow. I, I kind of did both. This, this university has like an excellent program, uh, which also, uh, assigns research mentors to the students in this program. So I was involved in different labs during, during med school. And something weird about Mexico as well is that when you are doing your residency, you are asked to do a research thesis. So I was exposed to different uh, contexts or backgrounds for biomedical research very early in my medical career. And then I pursued uh, also a research career when I finished my residency. So. Uh, in summary, I see, I see the difference in research medicine or biomedicine and uh, medical practice, but I see them as part of the same thing. I mean, of course, there are some different objectives or characteristics, for example. Something I, I typically mention to my residents is that uh, 
medicine or medical practice is not a science because it's not pursuing to expand our understanding about how things work. Med medicine or, or clinical medicine, it's just looking to make this person improve the likely outcomes of the disease they're dealing with or uh, ameliorate their symptoms or, or make them feel better, not necessarily answering a question about how uh, physiology works or, or what's the best way to treat pathology. Biomedicine or research medicine cares about that. And sometimes these things are in conflict. Sometimes what you have uh, as the evidence-based best advice is at odds with what your patient wants, for example. And this perhaps is a good cue to bring in the LMHR phenotype. As with the first paper, I mean, you can have rivers of ink spent to a particular drug, and there will be people who don't want to take it. And there will be people who don't feel well when they take this group of drugs. And sometimes you find out that a very relevant proportion of a group of, in any group of patients was left out or has been ignored. And you don't, you don't always have the opportunity of provide scientifically based uh, advice. And that's why N equals one is where you end up lots and lots of the times. I mean, uh, every patient is different. And sometimes uh, I remember I once had a patient who had, I mean, she was 95 years old when she asked me, how safe is this particular form of chemo for someone my age? And the answer was, we don't know. No one has done this. I mean. No one has studied this particular drug in this particular group of people. That This happens, I mean, this is just one example of something that happens every day in every single medical field. And clinical medicine and research medicine complement each other. They are not the same, but I'm used to looking at them as part of the same thing. Wow. Well, it's just so rare to see somebody do both. It's so much to take on to be able to do both. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the work of Travis Christofferson. Um, he wrote no. the book Curable. So, so he looked directly at these things. He looked at data collection and, you know, numbers, statistics specifically he talks a lot about the movie Moneyball and how, you know, we use mm -hmm. statistics to pick baseball players a lot better than we used to in the past and how in the medical system that is by and large absent. And these doctors, these poor doctors are left alone to make decisions when they have, you know, 6,000 drugs or 4,000 procedures. And he's uncovered things like one county with same demographic, two counties, one county had double the amount of stints put into hearts than this other county and numbers like that across the board. And it's, 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 I tried to make the point and he's made the point as well. It's like, we're flying. How many billions of people around in airplanes that never crash because we've got checklists and systems. Yet, you know, in, in the medical field, we don't hardly have any of that. And it would be so nice to mesh more of the data with more, more of, you know, the, the human side of being a doctor to make better decisions. It's, I mean, fortunately, it's changing. And actually, part of the checklist philosophy uh, from the air travel industry has been uh, brought to many different medical scenarios. Um, I couldn't agree more. I mean, of course, I'm biased because that's part of how I make my life, but it's crucially important to understand the limits of the evidence we have uh, because to go back to, I mean, or, or to start uh, addressing lipid metabolism, most of what we know or knew was studied in a very specific context, which is not necessarily informative of uh, other uh, physiological contexts that are perhaps equally safe or that are perhaps safer than other uh, dietary patterns for different diseases. So in the end, we should look and we should value 
data, but we should be mindful of the limits it has, particularly after only a few decades of uh, evidence-based medicine. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite easy to, to, I don't know if you've seen this graphic of, it's, it's actually a meme uh, of different data points and they say, okay, just data. And then when you have, uh, when you start connecting the dots, then perhaps you have information or you have insight or you have, one shouldn't confuse data with information, information with knowledge, knowledge with insight, uh, and none of the former with wisdom. So they are, they are uh, related, but certainly different. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think data could be a tool that can be used to better inform those decisions. But I, even with your research, I mean, you did some really interesting research during the pandemic about a doctor's kind of intuition about how to help people with COVID infections. I think that's a really good example of like, yes, we've got the data, but we also have human to human interaction and people that are very smart and very intuitive that can make the right decision in the right circumstance. It's, it's, I mean, it's something I, I, I also like saying. Uh, nowadays, we are enthralled with the advancement of artificial intelligence. And yes, I mean, it's something to be amazed of. I mean, it's, it's, it's really a field that exploded. But let's not forget that, I mean, artificial intelligence is amazing, but natural intelligence is still better. Uh, uh, it's, it's just the way it is. I mean, you could think every time someone pulls out uh, deep learning neural network AI algorithm for predicting this, okay, that's fantastic. But we also have a deep, deep learning neural network inside our skull that also works with Bayesian probabilities and updates itself and deals differently with uncertainty for addressing the same problem. So it's, of course, it's not that, it's not necessarily a competition, you know, like Kasparov versus Deep Blue or, or whatever, whatever human machine competition. It's more like, let's acknowledge the limits of each way of getting answers and use them the as wisest as possible for solving the problems that afflict most these days. Yeah, I love that. One of our former guests, uh, Lear Keith, was a, a vegan vegetarian for many years. And when she came out of it, she was pretty public about it and, you know, you know talked about the harms of a vegan diet. And somebody made some smear video about her. And, and part of this video, it showed like these, these three kids from an indigenous tribe and made the point like these kids don't know anything about nutrition. They didn't get any formal nutrition education. And it's like, shut your mouth. These kids know more about nutrition than any of us will ever learn in our entire lives. That's an like innate human wisdom. And you're right. It's nice to have both. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're they not at odds and it's simply, and the smart way to work with them is to, okay, of course, computers can calculate faster than we can and can deal with better accuracy perhaps but our intuition is better so yeah. yes. yes i agree Agreed. Well, I definitely want to talk about this study that you did, which I find absolutely fascinating. Um, Dave Feldman was the one who introduced me to the data here at Keto Salt Lake, actually, back in April. I think it was the day that it came out. It's absolutely wonderful um, data and, and so cool that you've got to be a part of it. I do want to ask, though, how were you introduced into the kind of low carbohydrate ketogenic space? Was it your work at university studying yeah. metabolism? Got it. How did it's, that well, no, about? no, not really. Uh, oh, I mean, as most med students, I have one year of biochemistry and zero hours of nutrition in my medical in my medical program. I was at a very prestigious university in Latin America, and I've been exposed to the medical program and curriculum of many different medical schools in the world, and they typically dedicate zero hours to nutrition teaching which is awful. Uh, fortunately, that's starting to change, but it's still an optional course, actually. If you, for those of you that, that have it, it's optional. And I mean, very nonsensical things in the way we are teaching medicine. Hopefully we're working, that will change soon. But anyway, uh, most of what I had was biochem and physiology during med school. When I was in my medical uh, residency in internal medicine, um, 
I, I mean, I started reading a bit more about metabolism. Mostly, I was interested those years in cancer metabolism. And actually, what what uh, got me first into into this space was fasting. I I I started reading about fasting, and then after reading fasting and kind of you know, reading again part of the metabolism I was taught in med school, uh, I fell into the calories in, calories out debate. And I found that, okay, many of the things I was taught perhaps do not make much sense and perhaps uh, need to be revisited. And then I basically stumbled into how much we still ignore in nutrition science. I, I, I was in, in my residency years when I started reading more and more and more. I had fantastic mentors in my hospital. Uh, one of them lent me, lent me a, his copy of Keith Frayn's book of human metabolism, uh, uh, Regulation Perspective. Uh, I read it cover to cover twice. And then I started, that's when I decided, back then I wanted to be a neurologist. Uh, but that's when I decided, no, I'm, I'm going to go for metabolism instead and to pursue a PhD. I started looking for PhD programs and that's how I got to Oxford. Um, in Oxford, I, I mean, by the time I got there, I, I was already practicing intermittent fasting and uh, practicing the different forms of a ketogenic diet. Um, and, uh, of course, during my PhD, I was exposed to more literature about ketogenic metabolism and to more super knowledgeable people about it. Uh, during my PhD years, I met Nick. And during those years, uh, well, each one of us was working in their respective your respective projects and the more and more i tried different dietary patterns the more and more i gravitated towards a low carb or mostly low carb uh way of eating uh in contrast with many in the keto space or the low carbohydrate space i have been so privileged that I, to be honest, I have never had to deal with any serious health problem. Uh, I've never had, I mean, besides my childhood obesity, which was harmless, so to speak, uh, I have never had to deal with anything, uh, autoimmune diseases, uh, pre-diabetes or diabetes or hypertension or, or any of the things most people have been struggling with before they fall into the keto space. I, I, I got here reading, you know, I, I got here uh, in the library and and that's that's been pretty much it. Uh, when I started interesting, yeah, when, when I became more interested in metabolism, uh, as with everything I read, I approached it with a more, with, with, with skepticism, I, I tend to, to, I approach everything new with skepticism. And of course, many of the things I read, uh, I tried them on myself and okay, I mean, I want to see if this is true or not. And that's why actually, and it's also perhaps a good cue, the first time I heard about Dave Feldman was uh, uh, in the Peter Atias podcast. And yeah, he was explaining, that. he was explaining the, the, meat, white bread, things he used to do. And I remember that the day I heard that his LDL went like, went down like 200 in three days or something, my first reaction was, this guy has to be lying. I mean, of course that's not possible, you know? Like, it's, there, there's no way. Uh, I, was, I was taught something entirely different. And of course, you can be sure that I prescribed lots of statins when I was a, a medical resident. And 
have been a nerdy student all of my life and I uh, devoured everything I had to read and applied it the way I was taught to do. And I, I, I kept questioning some of the things, but med school is so crammed that doesn't leave much room for questioning what you were learning as you go. And when I had a little bit more room for breathing, I started questioning the things I was doing. When I heard Dave could do this with his LGL and I had access to labs, I said, I'm gonna try that myself. I am fairly lean. I already, uh, I, I back then I went keto intermittently. So I started measuring my LDL. Okay, it's, I, I think it was 108. I started a ketogenic diet in a week. It was 195 or something like that. I reintroduced some carbs and it was 120. And, and in that way, and that's something, uh, I mean, I really hope that in the end, in a few years, any decent university should grant an honorary PhD to Dave Feldman because he's such an acute observer. I mean, he's a true scientist in, in every sense of the word. Yeah. He's, he's an observer and, and he, he has a, a very acute eye to this is not normal. And he's, and he's disciplined, he is methodic, he is, he would be any PhD, he would be the dream PhD student in any lab. Totally agree. How organized are his, is his data collection? And I, I, I hope any decent university should grant an honorary PhD to Dave uh, eventually. 100%. I think that should happen. And I think that a healthy, I mean, sadly, when medical doctors who, who spent more than a decade training hear that an engineer has some different ideas about how lipid metabolism works, they say like, oh, come on. I mean, who is this guy? You know, like the, the human uh, narcissistic, because I mean, let's be honest, clinicians are stereotypically narcissistic. Uh, of course, this guy is clueless about what he's talking. Of course, he is just trying to whatever. I mean, claim some attention or simply faking data, you know? But a true scientist, and that's what I was trying to do, and that's what I always try to do, when I saw the phenomenon he described on myself, a true scientist changes their beliefs when facing new data. When you face new data that contradicts what you said or what you thought, a true scientist should change their mind. That's it. I was yep. taught I was taught calories in, calories out, and I got straight A's in those exams in biochem. And I was taught that statins are the only way to bring down cholesterol, and I scored straight A's in those exams. And I was taught that for controlling diabetes, you should focus on this and that drug, and you should escalate these different algorithms. And I got straight A's in those exams. And I, I, I was a good student. I could still consider myself a good student, but when you face data that contradicts what you thought, you should change your mind. That's right. So I knew it's 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 basic, and I knew of Dave way before he knew of me. Wow. Uh, and actually, that was that was very funny. Um, I remember it was a Saturday night, uh, and I received uh, this text from Nick. And he said, uh, could you help us with some ANOVA testing? And because he knew I was interested in data analysis, et cetera, et cetera. I was already in Mexico, he was already in Boston. And I said, sure, okay, no problem. Let's zoom in uh, tomorrow morning. And the context for this particular, for how this is a good anecdote. When I was looking for different PhD programs, I applied to Harvard and Oxford. And for Harvard, of course, I was aiming for David Lovick. 
And I wrote to David and I asked him, do you have space for another, for another student? Because in Harvard's PhD program, you cannot choose your, your mentor right in the beginning. You need to spend different times in different labs and then you choose. And I didn't want to risk it going there. And in the end, uh, I opted for Oxford. And however, of course, I mean, one of the mentors I was looking for, I was looking for PhD programs, besides Kira Clark, who was my PhD supervisor, our Nick's and I PhD supervisors, was David Dobich. So Nick, Nick says to me, yeah, sure, let's, let's zoom in tomorrow morning, Sunday morning. Of course, I was wearing my pajamas. And the first, the first person I see in Zoom is David Ludwig. So I almost, I almost spit my coffee. And that's when Nick told me, okay, we have this amazing data. Dave managed to pull together over a little bit more than two years. And we believe it's perhaps enough to show or to document what he has been observing and what he has been talking about for the for two for the next two years. Uh, could you, uh, do you want to join in to analyze data? And of course that's like Christmas for me. So I said, yes, of course. And that's how, that's how I, that's how I met Dave. Uh, like more in, well, at least through the screen, you know, we, we have never met in person actually, but I knew of him and his ideas a few years before that, but that's how we started collaborating. Wow, that's amazing. What a cool story. I absolutely love that. Okay, so let me let me try to set this up and and correct me if I goof any of this kind of thing up. But I want to want to set this up in a way that the listener will kind of understand what's going on and and understand more of Dave's work. So, Dave decides several years ago that he wants to go on a low carbohydrate diet. He's tried other diets. He does research on a low carbohydrate diet and he gets fantastic results. He feels better. He loses weight. He loses his fat. Um, you know, he's not an obese guy, but, but definitely loses some excess fat and he's feeling amazing and everything seems to be going great. He goes to a blood draw. He notices that his triglycerides. So basically like the energy fat energy that's traveling around in the blood that comes from carbohydrate primarily is really low. So that's really good. The HDL number that he gets back, which every doctor says this is the quote unquote good cholesterol is actually really high. So that's really good. But then he notices that his LDL cholesterol or what every doctor pretty much will tell you is your quote unquote bad cholesterol is now really high very high the way that you described your own. In a week on low carbohydrate, your LDL cholesterol goes from 100 to nearly double that. It's, it's a big, big jump. And so it's like, okay, I'm feeling amazing. I lost weight. Everything else seems to be going good. But now I'm scared to death because the bad cholesterol that's going to give me a heart attack is now really, really high. Do I have that kind of situation? Yeah, absolutely. That's the scenario. That's an accurate okay. Uh, that's an accurate description of that of that particular scenario. And then he notices that when he reintroduces some carbs, LDL goes down massively. And I really cannot state the magnitude of these LDL drops. There is no drug that achieves this magnitude of LDL reduction in that time. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Like, like maybe a slight reduction, um, you know, by taking whatever statin drug for a long time or whatever. But yeah, you're right. There's nothing that can cause you know, literally like hundreds. I've seen the number drop by hundreds of, of you know, of points in, in a very short amount of time. And so, so what does this kind of summarizing, what does this lead Dave to believe and explore about how the body uses cholesterol? This is, I mean, and this is why I mean that he's a fantastic scientist and a fantastic, perhaps non-formally trained scientist. I mean, of course, I mean, he's an engineer. So of course he's familiar with organized thinking, you know, he's, uh, he's a clever guy. So he, he acknowledges that he observed something that most people didn't, accept, didn't expect and that is not explained by the current model of how things work. So his true scientist way of thinking is, okay, unexplained observation. The, uh, the, the model for explaining these phenomenon should be revisited. Then perhaps 
the model most people use or have needs to be refined. And so he starts applying his organized thinking into, okay, what does LDL do? What does triglycerides do? Where are LDL particles produced or BL, where do LDL particles come from? What are LDL particles made of and where they go? And what regulates or influences the rate they deliver, the energy they transport, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He started basically yeah. doing a PhD, reading as much as possible to, for, from this particular topic and organized in an organized way. Okay, this explains this, this doesn't, this doesn't. How with what we know and understand about these mechanisms and models, how do we make sense of this? And he deducts uh, a model that later on, after extensive literature review, and now some insightful data points, seems to be perhaps not the last and definitive version of how lipid metabolism works, but certainly a powerful one. Because in any other field of knowledge, a model is as strong as its predictions. And that's why the lipid energy model paper focuses so much on making testable predictions. It's, it's, it's a hypothesis and it makes sense because of A to C references. And the best we propose to test it out is with the following measurements within the following context. So Dave basically using organized thinking and good deduction and good literature review arrived to a set of ideas that are first of all testable. So they are scientific. If it's not falsifiable, it's not scientific, Karl Popper would say. And that makes sense with what we understand and with the body of evidence that has been produced in, in, in different contexts. So, so I think, I mean, again, it was the product of objective and organized observations and data collection, extensive Very literature nice. review with a naive and perhaps uh, naive in the way of not previously biased by taught ideas uh, from, from an academic background and uh, deduction power. So, so that's, that's pretty much how the lipid energy model came to be. And of course, when others and I jumped into the wagon, we, we brought perhaps some, or we found uh, different pieces of evidence in the literature that support these mechanisms. Wow. Yeah. So interesting. You mentioned the data collection. I know he spent a long, long amount of time collecting all of the data that he did, uh, which was a really arduous task. I know he spent months and months getting all the data, years actually. Um, so he finally collects all of this data. And what what were some of the findings and what really surprised you from some of the findings? And maybe we should go back and say, with the, with the lipid energy model, what are we saying what, what are we saying is happening with all of these LDLs? Like, what's the hypothesis before we get to the end results, I guess? Well, one of the main hypotheses is that when carbohydrates are restricted to meet energy demands, the liver secretes more BLDLs, which are quickly transformed into LDLs via the activity of lipoprotein lipase. So this is different because when carbohydrates are not restricted, there is not so much pressure on the liver to secrete VLDLs. Why VLDLs are secreted more? Because they need to meet energy demands. And actually one of the parts of the, of the lipid energy model paper emphasizes that anything that increases energy demand should push this VLDL secretion up, which could be cold exposure. And there are literature, literature examples where Cold exposure is associated with leanness for VLDL particles, like physical activity, which is something they've observed before. LMHR people tend to be physically active. So it makes sense, and it makes sense with the body of literature 
involving A and G, B, T, L, eight and three and four system. And the, the main observation or the main hypothesis is in the context of carbohydrate restriction, the liver secretes more VLDL to meet energy demands. And these VLDL are quickly transformed into LDL through an expanded or increased activity of lipoprotein lipase. And because LDL have a longer half-life in the bloodstream, they accumulate. So this explains why, this explains two very powerful things. Why LDL goes up in the context of carbohydrate restriction. It explains why LDL goes down when carbohydrates are reintroduced. Because when carbohydrates are reintroduced, then the liver does not have so much pressure for releasing fats. It can go, it can store glycogen and share more glucose. And therefore, after two or three days, these LDLs go down because not much more L VLDL are secreted. So it explains both observations and it explains as well, or predicts why lean people should have larger LDL elevations because at, when having less peripheral fat stores, your liver has much pressure to redistribute these VLDL. Yeah, wow, that's so interesting. Okay, so that was the hypothesis. What did you guys learn from the actual data from the study? Well, Dave organized the cholesterol super survey, which was an amazing uh, feat. He's, he, he, said, he basically organized an online survey where people could upload their lipid panel before going carbohydrate restriction and then after carbohydrate restriction. And they also introduced how many days were between tests. Uh, one of the challenges of this database was that, for example, people sometimes uploaded more than one test. They, they used it to see their progress or to follow their lipids. So of course, we had to remove repeated measurements for the same individual. Uh, not because there's anything wrong with them, but because they would be overrepresented. So we have to deal with that. Or people sometimes, I mean, humans, uh, despite how smart is our natural intelligence, we can still screw up with the keyboard and introduce some nonsensical values. Or sometimes people forget that one of the things that they wanted to collect was people with, without lipid medications. So some people uh, uploaded their results despite having uh, statins, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, what we found was that one of the strongest predictors, if not the strongest predictor for a large LDL change was the baseline BMI. In other words, the leaner you are, the larger your LDL changes before versus after carbohydrate restrictions, restriction where. So, uh, when when I and, and perhaps this is this is a, a relevant small uh, technical parenthesis, a linear model tries to predict uh, value with other factors or with values from other variables. The first time I heard about the LMHR phenotype, which is defined with lipid values, with the triglyceride value, with the HDL value, and with the LDL value, the first thing I thought was perhaps not knowing not knowing this dave proposed the linear model for predicting who is going to be lean because the lmhr i mean despite the name has lean in the you know the, the name of the phenotype lean uh, mass hyperresponders they are not defined by being lean they are defined by their lipid panel values and I saw a lecture where Dave was doing this almost party trick of predicting who was the owner of a particular lipid panel. What he was doing, even if he knew it or not, was using a linear model for predicting with a logistical regression who is going to be lean. So that was one of the things I wanted to test when I got this particular set of data. And in the end, it's true. One of the best things you can do uh, is to 
use the computer and its immense calculation power, and then tell the computer, look, these are all the data. Choose the variables you want with the cutouts you want to tell me how, which ones are, which variables and the respective cutoffs are the most useful for predicting who will have the largest LDL elevations. And the first variable was BMI and the first cutoff was 26. Basically, WHO's definition for being overweight or lean. So this is when something as unbiased as a computer, arrives to the same conclusion that someone observed. I mean, that reassures me, but that was not the only thing we analyzed. We put different models to compete with and without BMI, a model with and without BMI, a model with and without uh, triglycerides to HDL ratio, et cetera, et cetera. And consistently, BMI is one of the best predictors for who will have the largest LDL observations. After that, because a, an empirical definition, so to speak, for LMHRs already existed, which was Dave's. We tested, we created these subgroups of, okay, these people meet the definition, these people does not meet the definition because that database had people undergoing carbohydrate restriction from different BMI levels. So, okay, these people fulfills the LMHR criteria regardless of their BMI or not, and sure enough, people who do have lower BMIs, we compare those data against NHANES data and showed how people, LMHRs and non-LMHRs start carbohydrate restriction pretty much with the same distribution NHANES has, but those who are LMHR go way further in their LDL elevations. So they have pretty much the same starting point, but they don't have the same length for LDL elevations. I mean, Testing the same idea consistently resulted in BMI is definitely related with how large your LDL uh, elevations will be. So that was that was one. And I always try to emphasize that these set of analysis tell us nothing about cardiovascular risk. These set of observations and analysis tell us nothing about the mechanisms involved. Actually, part of the support for the lipid energy model comes in that paper, but it, this comes from Tro's clinic and the case studies that are part of that paper. Because Tro, Tro's patients, sure enough, those who started carbohydrate restriction with uh, a linear BMI have the largest LDL elevations and their LDL went down sometimes as much as 400 milligrams per deciliter down within a week with a little bit of carbohydrate restriction, sorry, carbohydrate reintroduction. So again, this is a nice case series and it supports some of the predictions of the model, but again, they have nothing to do yet with cardiovascular risk or do not, uh, close the conversation on what the involved mechanisms are. We are working on those projects to test the hypothesis we presented to the public, but that first paper is observational. It simply documents, although it does it for some bias, but in my opinion, solidly, that BMI is definitely related with LDL elevations in the context of carbohydrate restriction. Now, the lipid energy model paper presents publicly the set of ideas and the rationale for explaining that observation. And right now, as we speak, Matthew Budoff from the Lindquist Institute is doing a study focused on cardiovascular risk. And in my lab, we are working on, hopefully starting soon, a mechanistic study to corroborate that now prospectively, because this observational study was retrospective in nature, to corroborate prospectively, if BMI, if linear people who undergo a ketogenic diet have larger LDL elevations than people who start a ketogenic diet being overweight, and to measure lipids and lipid particles 
to start testing the predictions of the model. So in other words, it's just the natural flow or pipeline of ideas of this was observed, these are the ideas or mechanisms we think explain these observations. Now we're going to test them. Wow, that's, it's, it's so impressive. It's so cool to hear that. I think anybody who's been in the low carbohydrate space for long enough starts to get really good at tearing apart epidemiological or observational studies. And we hear them all the time. Red meat causes cancer. Um, you know, fruits and vegetables are the best thing you could possibly eat. And you start to pick those apart and say, okay, like they're not statistically significant. They're, they're not showing causation. You just said, we're not showing causation for anything, but this only strengthens our original ideas, our original hypotheses. And now we know that we can do further study, better studies, controlled studies that will show more of these relationships. It's absolutely wonderful. And, and if I'm, you know, if I'm one of these people, if I'm one of these lean mass hyper-responder people, I decide to go on a low carb ketogenic diet, my LDL cholesterol goes through the roof, I'm terrified, that you know, I, I feel great, but I don't want to keel over from a heart attack tomorrow. From this information, I now have, I, I can now make some, some decisions. And I can say, okay, I don't believe that LDL, an elevation in LDL cholesterol, even if it's very, very high, is going to lead to heart disease. So I'm going to continue eating a very low carbohydrate diet. I'm going to stay the course. I'm going to bet on that. Or I could also say, well, that hasn't been proven just yet. If I might, you know, decide to play it a little bit safe, maybe let me introduce 50 grams, 100 grams of carbohydrate every day. Either one is a perfectly viable option. Absolutely. I mean, and sometimes people think that we are pathologically uh, averse of statins. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I prescribed statins yesterday and I will prescribe statins tomorrow. And I will recommend statins to anyone who has had a heart attack or a stroke. Because That's I mean, right. the evidence is strong. People, people who, who are recovering from myocardial infarction or cerebral infarction definitely benefit from having statins. I have no problem with that. But there will always be people who refuse to take statins or who feel awfully with statins. And at the same time, what if we can simply recommend, hey, perhaps you should have a low in glycemic load carbohydrate meal every week? And that's it. I mean, if you ask me what I preferred my patients having, if another medication or a sweet potato, I will opt for this, the occasional sweet potato every single time no side effects. multiple reasons side effects price uh, it's an opportunity to for for the other day i was i was with one of my patients was saying that uh, she has a four-year-old kid and this kid is as i mean this kid basically negotiates as any four-year-old kid which is none at all and every friday the kid wants pizza so she feels obliged and to stop the kid from going mad, buys pizza. And she honestly and worried asks, what do I do? I mean, I will lose my mind if I, my four-year-old is a tyrant. Of course, you should always say, that, well, you are the adult. You are the one with the credit card and the mobile phone. Uh, the kid should adapt to you. But I also see this as an opportunity moment for, okay, what if you then, produce a family educational moment for your kid for we are going to get cauliflower pizza base and we're going to cook it ourselves. And you make of that a teaching moment and you are not saying no to pizza. You are not saying, you are using that moment to take control of what goes into your mouth, to take control what of what your kid is eating. And you're also using that to make your kid's life easier 20 years from now. So you can do that as well. I have absolutely no problem with medications. I use them all the time. I've seen tons of different medications save lives. 
that does not negate the fact that having a sweet potato can be also a teaching moment or an opportunity to ask a neighbor for, do you have a, any nice sweet potato recipe you can share with me? It's a bonding moment. And you won't get that with a statin or with any other drug. So in the end, food is better. Yeah, absolutely. And just the way we opened up this conversation, you, you said food, it's not nutrition. We don't eat grams of protein and grams of fat and grams of carbohydrate. We have food and beautiful culture. And the message behind what you said, your house is my house. Like that's, that's amazing. And that's part of who we are as humans. And food is such a big part of that. And you're right. What an amazing life lesson to teach somebody like, yes, let's eat the way we want to eat in this particular culture. Let's make some changes. Let's use it as a bonding moment, as a teaching moment for family, for friends, all those things. All of that can be done. And I, yeah, I just think that's so beautiful. I think it's very well expressed. And in the end, it's not. I also think that most debates uh most debates benefit from a less tribal attitude on both sides of the of whatever is the topic this go this is true for scientific debates political debates public health debates uh it's really not a matter of oh i need to be always right you need to be always wrong and I think that the dietary wars are particularly difficult in that matter because food is culture. And as, I mean, yeah, Mexicans are, yeah, proud about our wizardry skills in the kitchen. And we are, we, we may be convinced that it is a scientific fact. Our food is the best in the world, you know, like, like yeah, okay. We are tribal about that. Food will never stop being part of our culture. And in that way, uh, something I also say is that I love inor I, I love yeah inorganic food. But what I mean by that is organic in the chemical sense of the word. I mean, of course, food is organic because it's made with carbon, and we eat carbon derived substances. And what I mean with this inorganic food is the non carbon part of your dish, which is the emotions you attach to it the culture that's around it, the community feeling you get when, when sharing this recipe with a neighbor, with a, with, a, with a relative, this inorganic or intangible part of food is also part of your health. Is, is also, it, it also influences how likely you are to adhere to any behavior uh, the healthy and the non-healthy ones. And for that as well, I believe that building a healthier relationship with food overall is part of any health improvement. That's so beautiful, man. I absolutely love that. I'll give a shout out to Brazil when they did their latest nutritional guidelines. They didn't really have like eat this many grams of protein and don't eat saturated fat. It was more like eat real foods and try to share them with people you love, eat with your family. Like that's part of their nutritional guidelines. And I think that is so much more appropriate and keeping everything in context. I, 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 man, I was looking forward to this conversation so much. I always learn from you when I listen to you. And that, that piece alone, I think is, is so valuable for people to understand. What a fantastic conversation. Did we miss anything at all as far as where this data is going, where the science is going towards this? I mean, no, I don't think, I think that the, the, the key points, uh, we, we, we successfully touched the key points uh, in this set of ideas, of course, and uh, perhaps it's redundant, but we could be wrong, you know? It's, it's in science, it does not matter how beautiful your theory is, it does not matter how uh, theoretically sound and how many things fit in theory, we could be wrong. And it could be that LDL elevations are better explained by something else. However, and the same way we or I and others changed our minds about different nutrition topics when we face different data, perhaps this will happen. 
and it's okay. In the end, in the end, the important thing is to transparently test hypotheses, to transparently disclose those results. Uh, I like Bayesian thinking in the way of uh, is this this thing uh, Bayesian statistics basically loves doing or, or actually works. Uh, uh, Bayesian statistics work with uh, preconceived hypotheses and then testing how likely is this hypothesis in the face of the evidence. That's pretty much it. I think that's science and uh, I support or I hold these hypotheses because with the current knowledge I have are the best explanation for the observations I have. Uh, I hope in the next, in the next uh, years, we will find confirmation for some of those ideas. And surely enough, we will find some of those ideas that need to be refined or revisited. And the key, the, the, the key points are already there. Uh, Dave and others observed, uh, observed LDL changes that were not easily explained with the available metabolic models at the time, produced this set of ideas that yield these predictions that we are now, we, we indirectly been testing. Uh, uh, I mean, as a perhaps yeah, teaser trailer, there are different pieces of evidence that will be published soon that are indirect evidence for, for these predictions. We are working on the direct testing for these ideas. And we will see what the results tell us, what new hypotheses emerge. And in the end, that's the way science works. That's amazing. That's the way science works. What a great way to end this conversation. I think all of us could do a much better job of not falling in love with our own ideas and being open and willing to move science forward by being wrong, by learning new things and taking that with us. I, yeah, this has been such an awesome conversation. I love your work, dude. I, you're doing Thank you. such Thank amazing you. work, both in clinic and with the research that's just so unique. You never see that. It's very rare that you see that. So I just really appreciate you and your work. Where would you like people to go to find you and connect with you and your work? Uh, sure. Uh, I'm mostly available uh, by email. Uh, Adrian dot soto at tec dot mx tech doc dot mx which is my university here in mexico and that's the way uh, most people can contact me uh i am also uh fairly active in twitter uh at adrian sotomota uh but yeah i mostly respond by email uh, i use twitter more for reading than for writing and yeah, that's it. That's it. Uh, thank you for having me for the invitation. Uh, hopefully in a few months later, we can talk again about uh, emerging results and the new questions that emerge on the road. Absolutely. Brother, you have an invitation to come on our show anytime. This was a, a fantastic conversation. I'm so happy to see that, you know, things that we have observed in the low carbohydrate community are now being more closely looked at and more likely that they will be proven in the future. I think that brings a lot of hope for those of us who have chosen this way of life and feel better and, and want to continue to do this. So Dr. Adrian Sotomoda, thank you so very much for all of your work. And thank you for taking the time to be on our show today. It was an absolute honor. Thank you. And thank you to your listeners. Absolutely. And this has have been another episode of Balanced Body Radio.